This is the last week of our four-part series called Far More Abundantly. It actually grew out of our series on Ephesians, where Paul in Ephesians 3 has this incredible prayer about what God wants to do in our lives, how he wants to expand our lives, how he wants us to go deeper and, and do more through us. And it's possible because we're praying to a big God, a God who's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. God really does want to do far more in your life, far more in my life, far more in this church's life. And so we want to tap into how do we, how do we open ourselves up to allowing God to do far more abundantly? Well, one of those ways is in our finances because that often becomes a, 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 an area where we struggle with God. We struggle to release that to God. And so we spent several weeks looking at scriptures. We started in part one with looking at the story Jesus told of a rich, successful farmer who had such a bumper crop that he tore down his barns, built bigger ones, stored up so much that he decided he could retire early and enjoy all he saved up for himself. But the problem was he wasn't in control of the days of his life, and that very night he died. And Jesus concluded the story by just pointing this out. You can... You can go through your whole life making financial decisions that only concern yourself, that don't bring God into the picture, and you'll never get to enjoy it. And our desire is to to look at what God has given us, involve God in our finances, seek his wisdom in decisions, honor him in our giving. And so we looked at four four things we can do in part two, four countercultural decisions we make regarding finances, that if we put these in place, we find that um, things, things go so much smoother and there's a, all kinds of peace in our lives, starting with this, to, to give God the first and the best, to give God from what God has given us the first part and the best part. We don't give God from the leftovers. We, we right off the bat say, God, you're first. It all came from you, and it's a way of saying thank you to God, but also to say, I trust you, that the one who's provided all this will continue to provide it. We also looked at the, the second counterculture decision, which was to spend less than you make. That means that I'm content with what I have, and I trust that what God has given me is sufficient for my needs. And I also leave a little bit of margin there for the surprises that come up. Thirdly, we avoid and eliminate debt. The Bible says that debt is a master, and we become its slave. And probably all of us have experienced debt in our lives, uh, first of all, in mortgages. Uh, You're either going to pay rent or you're going to pay a mortgage unless somehow you've been blessed with an inheritance where you can buy a house for cash. But outside of something like that, all the other debts we take on are are debts that um, we have to ask ourselves, is that necessary? Do I have to do that? Because when we buy cars and buy clothes and buy food on credit, we end up paying this incredibly high interest rate on these debts. And it, and it traps us. It keeps us from being able to do other things. We end up spending um, hundreds and hundreds of dollars every year in unnecessary credit expenses. And so we want to get out of that trap. We, we not only want to pay down our debts and, and eliminate them, but quit accumulating new debts. And the fourth thing is to save for the future. That God wants us to be wise and have foresight to look ahead. It'd be like the ant, the Bible says. Think ahead. There's going to be a day coming when your body isn't going to be able to work like it has been, and you're going to need some funds to draw upon, and so we save for the future. And then last week, we focused specifically on the area of giving because Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. We want to be rivers, not reservoirs. A reservoir accumulates and accumulates and gets stagnant. A, a, a river receives and gives. It's like it's delivering something downstream to someone else. We get the benefit of it while it's with us, but we also bless other people. And so we looked at this idea of stewardship. It began in the Garden of Eden. God said, I'll provide all this stuff for you, all these trees. There's just a part of this that's off limits to you. And in in our finances, God says, I provided so much for you, but there's a part of that that I've set aside for myself. And it's called the tithe. And tithing is giving God the first 10%. It's a practice that was practiced in the Old Testament But the question was, does it carry on into the New Testament? Because the Bible really doesn't say a whole lot in the New Testament about tithing. And the reason is simply this. The principle actually has been raised to a higher level. It's to give generously. Paul said, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who wants to uh, reap generously must sow generously. And so, so God pours into our lap a good measure, poured down, pressed together, overflowing based on what we give. So it's like seeds that are planted. You want a great crop, plant a lot of seeds. You want a little crop, plant a few seeds. But it's up to us. But the desire God would have is that we become generous people. Well, there's all kinds of questions that arise in the area of finances, particularly in giving. So uh, we decided we're going to take the first part of the message today to address those questions. So I've asked Pastor Sam to join me today. So welcome, Pastor Sam, would you? (laughs) 
Hey, good morning. Um, so just so you guys know, Pastor Darren and I have um, a kind of a history in our relationship, even before I was on staff here, uh, where we would sit down, uh, usually in his office, usually like this, although um, I think I'm usually on that side when we do this, but... Um, uh, and we would sit down and talk through all kinds of issues, all kinds of theological issues and ideas, things that would come up in scripture, things that would come up in leadership. And so this has become uh, one of my favorite things to do is sit down and, and question uh, Pastor Darren about things. But I'm going to warn you, oftentimes these conversations go two and a half hours. So hold on, okay? Get, get ready. Comfortable. Get comfortable. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. We'll, we'll get on time. Uh, but we do have some questions this morning that I think are going to be really um, helpful for us to hear uh, kind of your perspective on and just unpack these a little bit. The first one, um, and I think many of us can, can relate to this, um, if not in the area of giving, in some area of our lives, and that is uh, my spouse and I are, are, are not on the same page when it comes to giving. Either um, I want to tithe and she doesn't want to give it all, or we can't ag- agree on an amount, or um, maybe my spouse doesn't believe the same way I do. We just cannot get on the same page about giving. What do we do about that? That's a good question. And you actually brought the bigger picture in. There's a lot of areas of life where as couples we don't agree on. And obviously I think God, when he brings two together to become one, it's very critical that you do come to agreement on important things. And giving is one of those. But I would say that if you're in a a relationship where your spouse is not a believer, maybe they don't go to church at all, and you're, you're feeling convicted by God to give, I would recommend this, that you have a sincere conversation with your spouse. Say, as a follower of the Lord, here's what God's put on my heart to do, but I want to honor you as my spouse and, and knowing what we should do as a family. Sometimes couples will do this. The husband, and now I'm going to say the husband because sometimes, <laughs> I say sometimes, more often than not, the wife wants to give more than the husband does. So she may say to her hus- husband, you know, I'd like to give, but I, I know that you don't feel the same way. He'll say, um, why don't you give from your income? if she has a source of income, but I'm not going to do it on mine. And they've compromised that way. But ideally, if you could have a a conversation with your spouse, if they're a believer, to say, we both love the Lord, we want to honor God, Uh, let's, let's listen to what God says and come to a place where we can agree on this. We want him to be Lord of our marriage. We want him to be Lord of our family and finances as part of that. Look at some scriptures, pray about them. See what God would say to you. And, and what I find in my marriage is my wife and I now, and there are financial issues, almost always, we, we go separately, pray about it, come back together, and we have most often the same dollar amount even. It's just, it's just amazing because we're coming from the same angle. But I would pray about it. I would um, also talk to some godly couples and find out how they process through this. But I value marriage unity and would not make um, giving a divisive point within my marriage, as important mm-hmm. as it is to give and honor God in that way, you, you, I think God wants you to honor your spouse. That's very important. Yeah, and I'll just echo that. Michelle and I have, um, over the years, begun this practice as well of uh, we'll go, if there's a big decision to be made, we'll go separately and, and pray about it, even for a couple of days, and then come back. And it's always, it's, it's kind of fun to say, hey, what, what number did you come up with? Um, and see what God does. And, and so often, I, I would say 99% of the time, uh, God gives us the exact same dollar amount uh, as we're listening to him and, and, and following him in that way. Right. Um, the other thing I heard you said that, about this, is I just want to recap a little bit, is um, that it's, it's really important to prioritize the relationship with your spouse rather than trying to prioritize some kind of formula of thinking, I have to give 10% or God's not going to bless me or take care of me. And so that becomes more important than my relationship with my spouse. What I, what I kind of heard you say yeah. was, yes, listen to God, honor God, but God has given you a priority of maintaining your relationship and managing that. And so fight for that relationship first. Yep. Is that pretty yep, accurate? Exactly. Great. Um, The next question um, comes from uh, a single person, and they said, I'm a single person. I don't make much. Um, Do I get to be exempt like I am on my taxes? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it sounds good, but actually, to be honest, uh, for many of us, tithing was easier when we were single. Uh, Even though we didn't make a lot of money, we had very little other expenses. And so uh, most people who tithe actually got started when they were younger, and they got in the pattern. And they, and they started to do it. It got more complicated when they got married, started having a house, uh, insurance premiums, uh, babies, all kinds of stuff start to add. So it's actually easier to start when you're um, at that level. And ironically, more people tithe that make less than $20,000 a year 
than tithe that make over $75,000 a year. Um, so it's not, it's, it's not a question of can I afford to do it. It's making that a priority. And I know if you're a single parent, I, my heart goes out to single parents because they usually don't have the highest paying jobs and they've got two or three kids and, and they're just depleted energy-wise. Uh, but I would say if you're in that situation where uh, we are just having such a difficult time making ends meet, make a commitment to put God's, God first on a regular basis. So every paycheck, God, we're going to commit this much and be consistent. And pray that God would bless that and bless your mm-hmm. obedience so that he could grow you to the place where you could re- get to tithe and eventually even be beyond tithing and be more generous. But start at a place where God, at least you know, God, your priority in my life. And maybe right now, this is my step of faith. This is how much faith I have. Mm-hmm. I'm going to step out this far that's right good. now, but make it consistent and stick to it. Yeah, that's good. Um, and I would agree with you. Uh, most of the people that I've talked to, um, as I've heard their stories, when they start uh, this process of tithing young when there's a little bit of money and, and there's, there's not very much to tithe on when they first start working um, and establish that pattern. It's actually easier, I think, for, for people in that situation to begin tithing on that $20,000 a year than it is to start when you're at forty or fifty or $60,000 a year. Uh, just the stories that I've heard, it, it's much, much easier to do that. Yeah. Um, and God also, uh, <clears throat> some, of the, some of the greatest um, examples of faith in Scripture are from poor people. Mm. And there's a group of churches that in Paul's day were in the area of Macedonia. And I want to read to you from uh, 2 Corinthians 8, the description of this church. Paul says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia for a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, and their extreme poverty. So these are really not just poor, they're dirt poor people, have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. So here was a a group of poor churches saying, are we exempt? No, 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 they didn't say that. They said, please let us participate in this this offering that's helping people that are in a famine. They actually begged to give. And so I think that's so honoring to God that... um, even the widow who came to the temple and put her two small copper coins in Jesus says, now that lady, that lady, that's, she is committed to me because she didn't have much to give and she gave it. Mm. So being poor isn't, isn't a, an opportunity to not give. It's probably a, an opportunity to give a more beautiful gift. Mm. You know, I want to come back to something that you, you unpacked just a minute ago as we were talking kind of about um, single parents in particular and, and very, very low income, very, very hard uh, lives where, where there's just not a lot of means there. And you kind of made it sound like it's okay not to, to tithe at first, but rather to give God the first part of whatever you are going to give. And I just want to unpack that because I think that it, it, it can be tempting to take that either way and say, well, well, the, the pastor just told me I don't have to tithe. Um, and also to say, well, the pastor told me I have to give something. And, and, and I, I just want to clarify because I think what we're saying here is that um, you know, tithing and giving to God is not a, it's not formulaic. We're not, we're not, we're not saying that if I do this, then God's going to bless me this way, or God's going to absolutely take care of all these things. Uh, really, it's a hard issue, and it's a discipline issue. And so what I hear you saying is to, to give sacrificially the first part of your income, whatever that is for you, and grow in being sacrificial as you grow in your relationship with God. Is that? Yeah, the, the first goal that I would say is to give faithfully, give mm-hmm. regularly. Second goal is to tithe. But even that's not the end goal. The, the goal is to become just a generous person with right. all that I have. So, so it's a progression, and you don't stop saying, well, I hit the first goal, that's all I want. No, God wants you way over here. Yeah. So you, as you're stepping toward it, some people can make that immediate jump to tithing, and that's awesome. Um, but some just need to get started. And for many of us, that's the first step is, let's just get started. Yeah, yeah, so good. Um, so our next question comes from someone who did not go to Financial Peace University uh, because they are up to their ears in debt. And we all know from Dave Ramsey that that's not a good idea. Right. Um, but this person, uh, you know, didn't make those choices at first. And, and they say, hey, I'm up to my ears in debt. Shouldn't I pay all of that off first, right? Shouldn't I get my snowball going uh, before I begin tithing? Yeah, uh, debt is a huge problem. In fact, debt keeps us not only from giving, keeps us from saving for retirement, keeps us from really doing a lot of things. It's a, it's a hindrance. Um, but I would say as much as you owe your creditors, you owe Visa, you owe MasterCard, you owe SoFi, you owe um, whatever, what, you know, American Furniture Warehouse, wherever you've gotten your loans from, you owe all them, you owe a greater debt to God. 
I mean, we think about it, who gave us first? God did. They didn't. And so I would say, honor God first. Keep paying your debts down, but get, get, that, get that paid down uh, and, and then get it behind you. But don't let that linger because the temptation is, if I'm paying my credit and ignoring God, I'm going to keep using credit and, and, and keep relying on it, and I never, ever get to the point of honoring God. Part of the reason we got into, into debt in the first place is I wasn't honoring God. Mm. I wasn't content with what God gave me. So mm. reversing that and say, okay, I'm going to start saying, God, I thank you for what I have. Mm -hmm. And you provided. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to get this debt behind it, get it in the rear view mirror, and move forward. Yeah, that's good. Uh, the next one is, is really similar uh, to that question. Is it wiser to blank? Um, a lot of similar questions here. Is it wiser to establish my retirement fund? Is it wiser to establish my kid's college fund? Is it wiser to set aside money for the new car so I don't have to take on a car payment uh, you know, debt in the future? Is it wiser to get those savings goals really uh, taken care of and established first and then start tithing. Well, those, those make a lot of sense, especially if you take a financial class or talk to a financial planner. All the things you need to get in place to make your life secure. But you can be like that farmer who made his life secure and then, then he died prematurely and didn't get to enjoy even what he had. I think our security has to first be in the Lord. Mm -hmm. I, I rely on him. I trust him. And so every stage of life has their bills you know, from college students to young marrieds to middle age to retirees, you can always come up with something that you need to fund mm. and some need that, that needs money. And uh, while you want to address the needs in your life, back to that last issue, my first need is to trust God. Mm. And I think rather than go, is it wiser to do this before I give, is it wiser to give before I do blank and fill in the blank and start really asking ourselves, if I gave first, what would I have to sacrifice to do that? Uh, we don't have to have cable TV. We don't have to have cell phones. We don't have to have a brand new car. There's a lot of stuff we don't have to have that we could do without if we wanted to really honor God mm -hmm. first. And God is so honored by sacrifice. There's a lady, uh, in fact, I want to read her story that's found in the Gospel of Mark. Um, very likely she's a, a single woman, probably a prostitute. And her, her life savings was wrapped up in a bottle of perfume. Mm. It says, while he was at Bethany, that's Jesus, in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at a table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment, of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. So break it means, I'm never going to use this again. I'm, I'm going to use all of it tonight or today. And there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii. By the way, denarii is a day's wage. This is basically a whole year's salary. This could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Hmm. Uh, I, I would encourage you, instead of looking at what you can do for yourself before you do something for the Lord, do something beautiful for him. Mm. Because if you have to cut something out of your life and say, you know what, we delayed, we delayed buying something, we put off uh, a major trip because we wanted to make sure that God still remained first in our lives, mm. I, I would say that's a beautiful thing and it honors the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as you were reading that, I was just thinking uh, about uh, the character of God and how God is um, a, a God of abundance, not a God of scarcity. And, um, and he says, far more abundantly, right, um, uh, than all we can ask or imagine. And, and it, it, just, it just strikes me that, um, you know, oftentimes we're thinking, shouldn't I get this taken care of? And part of that comes from a scarcity mindset going, hey, if I don't do this, can I trust God to come through on this? And, and the problem with a scarcity mindset is you never put yourself in a position when you're trying to control all those things and, and make sure that you have everything taken care of. You never put yourself in a position to allow God uh, to show up and show off in your life. Whereas if you put him first and, and create these um, moments where you go, you know, God, we're not going to do this thing unless you come through. We're not going to have have, uh, in our case, it's been a new home. Uh, yeah. we've, we've lived six people in 1,100 square feet for 13 years. Um, well, I mean, my daughter was born 12 years ago, but we've lived there for a long time, and, and we've just gotten by and trusted God. And, and, um, and because we, we've been faithful and, and said, hey, God, you get, you're going to have to come through um, and, and put ourselves in a position, God has then shown us and, and come through over and over again to say, hey, you know, you think that, that it's all on you, but I'm a good father, and I have beautiful gifts for you, and you're, you're doing what you're supposed to do. Let me come through and do what I do. Um, and so yeah, just, and the story of the lady, what really impressed me is she had this, I don't know, $30,000 yeah. 
a bottle of perfume and said, it's worth giving up this because I'm getting this. Yeah. You know, I, I have Jesus. Right. And that surpasses even the value of this. Yeah, it's so good. Um, all right. So the next one, and this is, um, this is a, a good one uh, for us right now. Um, a lot of us are thinking about our gross and net income because it's tax season. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm curious, should I tithe on my gross or my net income? Yeah. If, if you're tithing at all, I would say, bravo. You made a, you made, you're, you're the minority. Um, but I'll just share with you that for us personally, for Julie and I, we just look at um, tithing is what God has given us, the first part of what God has given us. What has God given us? That's, that means that's my salary. That's before any taxes, anything else is taken out because all the taxes um, that go out are really like bills. I mean, they provide government services that I benefit from. Maybe they go to Social Security, which you, know, you benefit from. They go to things, so it's almost like another bill. So for us... I'd rather, I'd rather err on the side of trusting God more hmm. than trusting him less. And so for us, it just makes a lot of sense. Say, it's just so easy. I take my salary, divide it by 52, and that's what I give every week. Yeah. And so um, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy, though I don't condemn anybody for, for doing it the other way. I would say that if you start looking at, at how, what can I deduct before I tithe, it can be a dangerous pattern to go down because you can start saying, well, my retirement comes out and then my housing allowance comes out and all that. And then you have this little amount and, and I think God says, I gave you more than that. <laughs> so uh, just, just make sure your, your heart's in a good place when you go down that path. Yeah. And just pray and talk as a couple of what God would have you do. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, that idea of what, what can I take off of this um, really leads into our next question well. Um, does my tithe have to go to my church or can I, um, you know, that, that money that I handed to the homeless person, can I take that off my 10% because I'm serving God by taking care of the homeless? You know, does, does my tithe have to go yeah. there or can I kind of decide how to break this up and, and give to who I want to give to? There's a, um, there's a lot of pastors who will say that the church is a New Testament storehouse. In the Old Testament, it said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, when you think of that in, in Israel, they brought in grain, they brought in animals, they brought in money. And so literally, there was a storehouse, a warehouse, where you kept a lot of that stuff. And then um, it supported the Levites, the whole tribe of Levite. Um, they didn't have paying jobs. They worked in the temple. So they were covered by the donations of the people, much like um, church staffs are covered by churches. And then you had... Um, Money went to the widows and to the poor out of the storehouse. And so some would say, well, the, the church is the New Testament storehouse. I don't fully agree with that. Um, one of the differences between the church and Israel, Israel was a theocracy, meaning it was their own system, fully, fully enclosed system of government, where we have government and we also have parachurch ministries outside the church, ministries that partner with the local church, not in competition, but work alongside. So you've got Compassion International, Focus on the Family, uh, all kinds of mission organizations that are very worthy, and we want to support them. And so my recommendation to people would be to always support your home church first. And, and, uh, and whether you take a part of your tithe or give beyond your tithe to another organization, that's fine. But I really believe, I really believe God's core um, agency in the world is his local church. It's where Sunday services are held every week, where the word is preached on a continual basis, where children are educated and discipled, where benevolence is handed out, where um, weddings and funerals are, are conducted. I mean, all the ministry that takes place through the church is so powerful. And uh, so I, be I believe in the local church. I believe in the missionaries that we support as a church. But uh, if you've got, like we do, we have a Compassion International child we support every month. That's something we do on the side. We support different missionaries on the side. We do some other things. So um, I, I like to ask myself this. If I was the example, not the exception, if I was an example for everyone else and everyone did as I did, what would happen? If everyone decided, hey, I'm not going to give my money to the church, I'm going to give it somewhere else, then we couldn't do what we do. Mm -hmm. So just be the example that you would want others to follow. Well, I have a, a follow-up question, a similar yeah. question. You, you've convinced me um, that I need to, to stop counting um, what I'm giving to other organizations as part of my tithe. So I'll, I'll give my whole tithe to the church from now on. I'm just kidding. I was already doing that. Um, but, um, but, you know, I, I really, really love what's happening in our kid ministry and our student ministry. And, you know, I, I don't know about that Rick guy. I just don't know about the care center and the stuff they're doing down there. So I'm going to direct my tithe towards the ministries that I really like and want to yes. see grow and feel like are, are not uh, funded well enough. Is that okay? I would say that's not a good idea. <laughs> we try to have very few designated funds for that reason. If, if we all gave to our pet, pet areas... 
um, we would have ministries in the church that would really struggle uh, because, because very few people might be passionate about it. For example, who's going to pay for the water bill? Who's going to pay for the electric bill? Who's going to pay for cleaning supplies? I mean, they're not glamorous kinds of things. I'd rather put my money toward this ministry and see it all go to there. We establish a budget for um, the ministries within our departments that we believe is appropriate for the year. And, and when we give to the church as a whole, those ministries get that money. If I choose to give something extra, what, what it does is it's like I'm, I'm getting around the process of the leadership so that I can have more say in that ministry, and we're going to build up the pot in that ministry, so all this money is going to flow in, say, to kids' ministry, so that, Sam, you can do now things that maybe the elders didn't approve you doing, mm. because you've got all this extra money, and it's an, really, it's a, um, it's a statement of trust in the mm. staff, in particular, because yeah. the staff set the budget, and the, and the elders approve the overall budget, so it's really saying, I trust the people who are leading those ministries to do well, but it's also saying, I believe in the bigger picture of the church. Um, all the ministries that are taking place, just not the one that appeals to me. Yeah, yeah. And, and just to let you guys know, um, we're very transparent in this area. So if you're curious about why something wasn't funded or why um, this amount went to kids' ministry and student ministry instead of this amount or, or why, you know, the, the budget is the way it is, um, I would be happy to sit down with any one of you and talk through how we sought the Lord and how we trusted God and how God brought us to those decisions uh, and those recommendations. Uh, be more than happy uh, to walk through the process with you. We really believe that we're doing exactly what God has called us to do. And so there's no reason for us to hide any of that, uh, just so you know. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're on the last question. Yep. Last question. So I, I'm feeling really um, kind of guilty about, about tithing because I haven't really been doing it, and I just don't know how I can work it in my budget. So can I tithe on my time instead of my money? Good question. And I've heard that before. Can I, can I tithe some other way than money? Um, I would say it's not an, e- it's not an either or, it's mm. a both and. We should, we should be stewards of all that God's given us, mm. time, money, talents, treasures, all that kind of stuff. And so may, maybe things are hard, and that's why I said get started, but to use it as an excuse to not give oftentimes comes across as I really treasure money a lot, and I'd rather give time because that's easier than to give my money. Mm. But um, in fact, Jesus warned us, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Mm. Um, and so we want our, our heart to be in the, in the good places, and I want it to be in God's kingdom and what he's doing. So uh, people who give money shouldn't have the excuse, well, I gave money, I, therefore I don't serve. I don't give any of my time. Mm. No, it's, it's, it's a both. You want to do both because we're stewards of, of both. Mm. Great. Well, thank you so much. As always, it's been a pleasure um, having this conversation with you. Yes. And I know you've got some exciting things to share with them. Yeah, so I actually you... want to, wanna, there's Uh-oh. a gentleman I want to introduce you to. You're going to actually watch on this video who, who a while back had a lot of questions about these areas, mm. and God's done a, a huge work in his life. So listen to this testimony of Farron and Roby. I've been tithing for about four years now, um, consistently. Um, I really started because my wife kind of drove me to it uh, to get me to understand. Prior to that, I didn't tithe because I didn't believe in it. Um, I give online because that way it's first, it's the first thing I do. And that's easier for me. Um, I used to write a check, but when I wrote a check, I was inconsistent. And I didn't want to be inconsistent when I'm giving to God. That's the worst thing I could do. Early on, tithing was difficult because I didn't believe in in man, I didn't believe in people, um, and I didn't understand what God wanted me to do with it. So, and then the difficulty was living paycheck to paycheck because I wasn't doing right with God's money, which I didn't understand at the time. That was difficult because I didn't, I did, I wasn't making ends meet the right way. And so that was hard. Um, But once I got it on track, it's not difficult at all anymore. So tithing became easier and easier the more I trusted God. And I think that was the toughest thing was the trust. That was hard, trust. So once I started trusting and having that faith, it's not hard at all anymore. It's easy. You know, I grew up Catholic in a sense um, in my preteen years. And the side of town I grew up on, you know, I used to hear a lot of stories about things that would happen in the church. And you see the preachers and pastors, and you see them in, for lack of a better word, fancy cars, and things that they were doing with what I thought was my money at the time. 
and what well, would be my money and I would say well why am I giving them my money to do those things and I said I'm not tithing because if they're gonna do that I could keep my money in my pocket and I didn't know I had no clue right because I wasn't being taught what tithing really meant I saw my mother put money in there but I didn't know what it really meant I didn't know it was God's money and it was their responsibility to do right with the money with his money I didn't know it wasn't my money at the time so uh, but I learned as I as I progressed through specifically in the last four years as I progressed I really learned that it's his money and it's not my money and he allows me to do what he wants me to do with it because before I wasn't I wasn't really reading or talking to him or praying I should say and now I do and I said, God, what do you want me to do? Not only with your money, with my life. And so now that I do those things, he, you know, that relationship has built a much better relationship between us because he's always been there. I've just been the one that's not been doing what I was supposed to do. I just never trusted. So it's built a better relationship from my side <laughs> to trust and believe in him. I mentioned when you came in, there was a card that you received. We actually passed these out last week, a response card. You don't have to do anything with this if you don't want to, but uh, if God has been speaking to you, this is a great way to respond to him. For some of you, this is a time to say, this is a day when I'm actually pounding a stake in the ground, or we as a couple are, are putting a stake down. We're going to do things differently going forward, and maybe it is we're going to start giving regularly. Uh, and may, maybe that's your decision that God's been prompting your heart to make. Maybe for some of you to say, say you know what, Let's, we're going to do what some of these people in the church are doing. We're going to start tithing, doing the tithing thing. And maybe that's your commitment of what God is prompting you to do. And some of you who've been tithing for some time, God's been telling you, hey, it's time to even step beyond that. And we, he wants you to, to step beyond tithing. And so there's a place you can mark down what it is God's telling you to do, a place to put your name. We're not going to uh, phone call you or hassle you. In fact, one of the things I wanted you to know is nobody in the church other than our financial um, department, knows what anybody gives in the church. We don't track that. So um, don't, don't be afraid of someone else spying in on your personal information. That's not the purpose at all. Purpose is that we're being obedient to what God is telling us to do. So when the offering's passed a little bit later, you can place that in. And Theron mentioned something that I think is very helpful for us in uh, being disciplined, and that is online giving. And there's instructions in your bulletin how you can do that if you've never done it. I mean, it's just so wonderful to be able to set things up where it's weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, however it is that you want to do something, you can do it online. Well, I want you to take out this other handout that says, where are we growing? I want to share with you, it's pretty exciting, what God has been putting on the hearts of our staff and elders over the last several months, probably the last six months, as we've been discussing things of where, where God's leading us to go. We felt the nudge, God says, okay, it's, ne- it's time for the next big step. What is it? And uh, we had something in our mind, and then uh, God took a turn. So it took us another direction. And so I want to share with you three different phases of where we see our church expanding over the next several years. First of all, phase one is to renovate, renovate the next-gen ministry areas. The older buildings got a lot of wear and tear, and it served a good purpose, um, but it needs to be kind of retrofitted to meet our current ministry needs. And so what that means is our intention is to shrink the, the main meeting size in the next-gen center, that's a big, our old worship center, shrink it down by putting in walls uh, on the inside of it and create classrooms that are on the lower level and upper level, at least open areas where, where our ministries can have breakouts. What we found is our, our best ministries operate by a large group, small group format. You meet as a big group. There's a lot of encouragement in teaching, and you break up into small groups. It's true for student ministry. It's true for Celebrate Recovery. It's true for Reengage. And so we can meet as a big group, and we can, we can seat 150, 200 people in the center area, and we can break up into smaller groups where you have a little bit of privacy from the other groups, and you can focus on your small group leader and what they're trying to teach you. Also, our intention is to... Um, is to redo the hallways in that building, is particularly upstairs, and expand the children's worship area, which is in the far uh, northwest corner upstairs. Um, it's getting pretty full up there, and that's where children gather for worship. We want to actually knock some walls out and make that bigger for the kids. And we believe both of those areas will service our student and children's ministry for years to come and also benefit adult ministries that use that place. Our intention is to begin 
officially raising funds as a, as a congregation either in the fall or right after the first of the year, but we're already opening the, the fund for that. In fact, we've received the first gift this, this past month already for the next project. So if you feel led by the Lord to give to it, we're going to show every week in the bulletin a, a growing balance in our building fund. Phase two and phase three are, are really kind of together because one can't happen without the other. We really want to finish our basement, but in order to do that, we've got to move things that are in the basement out of the basement. So what that means is our care center has done phenomenal ministry, and they've maxed out their space. They actually need twice as much space as they have. And so our intention is to build a, a standalone building out here on this side, that empty lot over here. That'll be a two-story building. On the upper level will all be a care center that can be accessible off El Turis real easily. And uh, underneath that will be, uh, on, the, on that lower side, will be some space for a maintenance facility for all the stuff that we've been storing downstairs and equipment um, to be used there. Our care center has been a significant ministry in this community, and we believe God wants us to, to go bigger in what we're doing to reach our community. At the same time, as that moves out, that then positions us for phase three, which is to finish the basement. We're going to move our staff offices out of that building over there, bring them down here, use the care center entrance as a main entrance for the staff through the week, and this whole side over here downstairs. If you never, some people told me, I didn't know we had a basement. We do. We have a basement right under here. And this, and if you ever want a tour, we'll give one to you. But down here on this side will be all offices. And then this whole side will be large classrooms, adult classrooms for meeting spaces. And we believe that when all of those three pieces are in place, we'll be set to expand ministry in every department in a much greater way. So I'm just sharing that with you. And, there's, and the descriptions are on here with this caveat. Um, we don't know what the future holds. There are, there are um, economic factors that come into play. There's the responsiveness of us, you know, how generous we are toward accomplishing them. The elders are committed. We're not going to take out any more debt to build. And so we'll build as the gifts come in. Um, but we believe God wants us to push forward and to do it. He wants to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or imagine. And so there's information on the back of three things you can do. And I won't go through all the details, but one is to pray. This gives you an idea of how to be praying um, for our church and for what God has put on our hearts to do. Secondly, is to learn. As we start rolling out information and having meetings available, we just signed an architect, a really great architect here in town that's going to work with us. Um, come and ask questions, learn what God's doing. And then third, to give. That if God's enabled you to give toward that fund, like I said, it's already open. We'll, we'll, we'll build it up until... Uh, we have enough funds to build that. And hopefully by the fall or the early spring, we'll have gathered enough money to build in the summer and then next fall, be able to open that up for our kids and our students. And I'm sharing all that with you because some of you may be thinking, well, Pastor, I may not be here in five, 10 years when all this is complete. I may not be here either. But, but here's what I know. I walked over, actually, I drove over to our old building on Aspen Drive the other day. And I just reminisced a little bit there that there was a group of people back then who had a piece of property up on the hill and, so, and decided they were going to sell that piece of property in order to buy this property over here on Bradley Road. The property we sold was bought by our community center. It's where the soccer and, uh, and uh, base, our softball fields are. Uh, that used to be our church property. But we figured that's not a really accessible location. This is. And so we relocated here in 2001, opened up the building over there with the intent that one day we would build a bigger worship center, which is this. We built this seven years ago, opened up. And, uh, and when I thought back of the people down on Aspen Drive, when we came in 1995, there were 350 people in that church. And most of those people aren't in the church today, but there are many who still are. And I'm so grateful that those people look beyond themselves. Many of them are older people who said, you know, I'm at a stage where I may not benefit from all those facilities but look what God has done. Look what God has done for us. I personally don't use the care center, but look what it's done for our community. I'm so glad we have a care center. I believe God wants to, to do so much more in our community. And what excites me is, is there are so many needs in the Fountain Valley. And that God is positioning us not only to do ministry right now, but to set things up for the generation to come. So when our kids inherit a building, my whole goal in, in like about 10 years, 10 to 12 years, we'd not only have those buildings built, but we would be debt free. So the next generation isn't paying any credit on, on facilities. They're putting everything into ministry. And so we can help make that possible. And, and we have a God that can do that. And so that's why we start with prayer and ask you to partner with us. You know, someone may be thinking, oh, pastor, it would be so... So awesome as someone who write the church in their will and leave a big gift when they die. But I just want to tell you, someone did leave a big gift in their will when they died, and his name was Jesus. 